The uh, scripture lesson this morning is Psalm 8, and we will read that together. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, one of the mouths of babes and infants. You have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are humans that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And we have Alexa and Eliana and Jeremiah and Teresa and Ben and James. Good crowd. Good to see you all this morning. How's everyone doing? Okay. Pastor Robin is not here this morning, and I should have said that earlier. She's, she's actually visiting the International Space Station. No, she's not. She's tra- but she is traveling this week, and uh, she'll be back next week. And next week is also the last week of Sunday school. Now, some of you may remember that a few weeks ago, Pastor Robin talked about what's your, asked you what your favorite flavor of ice cream was. Do you remember that? Is anyone here for that? Okay. And then at the end, she said, maybe we should have an ice cream social. Maybe we should have an ice cream party. So next week, we're going to have an ice cream party. And you want, you're going to want to come for that. But in the meantime, I want you to take a look at the first photograph on this screen. Does anybody know what that's a picture of? Yes. It's a picture of space. Anything in specific that that's a picture of? You can't really see that around here. Yes. A galaxy. Do you know which galaxy? The Milky Way. Very good. That's the Milky Way. Uh, Alexa gets the prize this morning. Now, uh, the Milky Way is the name of the galaxy that we live in. It's made up of billions, hundreds of billions of stars. At least that's what scientists think. Our sun is only one of the stars in the, gal- in the Milky Way galaxy. Around here, it's hard to see the Milky Way because, uh, you need, uh, because there's so much light around here. You need to be far away from cities where there's a lot of light and street lights and, and uh, uh, that sort of thing, house lights, uh, building lights. Uh, but there are some places where you can go and, and see the Milky Way. Maybe you've been to some of those places way out in the country like way up in Vermont. Uh, I think if, if some of our students were here this morning, they would, they would say they've been in Vermont and they've seen the, uh, uh, the Milky Way. Uh, I know there's, there are some people here who spend some time up in the Adirondacks, at the mountains way up in New York State, and you can see the Milky Way from, from up there. Uh, but the, the Milky Way is, um, you can't really see it around here. Uh, can I get the second slide? Uh, Some of those stars that you see at night are actually planets. And I took this photo of Venus and the moon and Jupiter. Those are the, the, you see the moon, right? The crescent moon. And then there's two stars, one below to the the left and one above it to the right. Those are Venus and Jupiter. And I took that a few years ago. And down below, you see a, a down below the moon, there's a building with a little bit of a red dot on it. I think that's the Empire State Building. And that's what I can see from my backyard. That's what Mrs. Walsh and I can see from, from our backyard. Uh, it, uh, you, you, sometimes we can see Saturn at night. And uh, a couple of years ago, Mrs. Walsh and I went to an observatory. That's a building with a big telescope in it. And we went and climbed and we looked through this, the telescope. And the telescope was pointed at Saturn. And we could see the rings of Saturn. You can't see the rings it, up nowadays. If you, if, now if you went out, it would actually have to be early in the morning if you, to go out and, and look and see Saturn. Uh, you, don't, you just see a, a point of light up in, this, up in the sky. But if you look through a telescope that's powerful enough, you can see the rings of Saturn. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the planets that uh, 
Uh, miss, okay, here, where are we? I've written out my notes, but I'm not following them. Uh, this photograph was taken by a space probe called Cassini a few years ago. Cassini flew past Saturn, and that's Saturn, the, the black area up in the upper left, and that, that uh, stripe, striped area, those are the rings of Saturn. So it, Cassini was very close to Saturn at that point, and it was actually looking, the camera was pointed back towards the Earth. You see the little arrow in the lower right? You see that arrow? That's the planet Earth. That's what we look like from Saturn. We're just this, we look like a star in the sky. If, we were, if you stood on Saturn, we look like a star in the sky. Saturn is about, at the closest, it's about 750 million miles away. If you spoke into a radio now and that radio could be heard on Saturn, it would take over a minute for your voice to be heard on Saturn. Or if you spoke into a cell phone and that signal could travel to Saturn, it would take over a minute for them to hear you on Saturn. Um, fifth slide. Earth looks pretty small from Saturn. Earth looks like just one of, the, one of the stars, and that kind of brings us back to the Milky Way. When Jesus was alive, this, uh, when Jesus went out at night, this is what he saw. He saw something that looked like that. He could see the Milky Way. Wherever you went on the planet Earth, back then, almost wherever you went, maybe if you went someplace where they had torches all around, you couldn't see the Milky Way. But if you went out to your house at, at night, the chances are you could see the Milky Way. Be, long before David, there was, long before Jesus, there was a king in Israel where Jesus lived named David. You've heard that name, right? David wrote the Psalms. The Psalms are like hymns. And David wrote a Psalm that said, when I look up at the night sky, I see all these stars. I see millions. He didn't know that there were millions of stars or, or billions of stars up there, but he's, he's, he saw all these stars, and he said, it's such a beautiful universe that you've created, God, Lord God. Uh, Mr. Heck ju just led us in reading those words. You've created a beautiful universe, our sovereign God, sovereign Lord. What, what's so special about us? You're so big, our, and our universe is so vast. What's so special about, about us that you, uh, that you pay attention to us? We're so small. We're just this tiny little speck out in the universe. But you know what? We are very special to God. God does pay attention to us. God pays such close attention to us that he, uh, uh, that he cares about us, and he cares enough about us that he sent his son Jesus to be our savior. God, cares all, God also cares about the earth that, that, uh, that we live on. And God wants us to, be, to take care of the earth. But most importantly, God cares about us. And God sent his son Jesus to be our savior. Uh, will you pray with me? And Ms., then you're going to go with Mrs. Walsh to Sunday school? Gracious Father, we thank you, our sovereign Lord, that you have made us uh, and sometimes it seemed like we we're very insignificant in the vast scheme of things, in the vast universe. But yet, we are very important to you. So important that you sent your son Jesus to be our Savior. And we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice. Thank you that we can come and study your word. Bless us now. Bless the class now as they go with Mrs. Walsh to Sunday school. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the first chapter of John, verses 1 through 5 and verses 10 through 13. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power 
to become children of God, who are born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. Let us pray. Mm. Father God, we ask for your presence to be with us. We ask for your spirit to anoint us, not just me who's speaking, but those who are listening, that they would hear your words as you intend them to be heard. Grant that you would be glorified in what is said and in what is heard. And we pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. You know, I, I asked myself just this morning, why did you decide to preach on the Trinity? The Trinity? It's not the easiest subject to broach, but I'm going to try. God begin, um, John begins his gospel with an obvious reference to the creation story in Genesis that results in a Trinitarian account of creation. Because when we read those first few verses, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the deep, the only one that seems to be missing is the sun. But John introduces the sun into the creation story by identifying him as the word. God spoke, the word acted. And by identifying the Son as the Word, who is also God, we have the three persons of the Trinity at the beginning of creation. But John also speaks of the Son using language that's similar to what was used to describe wisdom in Proverbs 8, 22-31. In those verses, wisdom is described as being beside God as a worker or artisan during creation. And this reminds me of the Jewish belief that the Torah was the blueprint for creation. But throughout this chapter, this chapter, Proverbs 8, wisdom is treated as the personification of truth and knowledge. Embracing wisdom was to embrace wise, righteous living. And even though John uses language reminiscent of wisdom, a created thing, John makes it clear that Jesus is the creator. He's not an assistant or a helper. He is the creator. That used to bother me a little bit because I always thought of God equals Father as the creator. But as I've grown in Christ and as I've grown in my study of the word, I've come to understand that my view of God, it's been a little simplistic. Now, Christians looked at the Old Testament in light of the coming of Jesus and recognized his presence in the Old Testament. And by the time that the Gospel of John was writing, um, the Trinity was already a concept. It wasn't called the Trinity at that point. But the idea that God was existing in three separate unique yet intertwined persons was something that was already understood. And Paul's writings, which are some of the earliest New Testament scriptures, reflected a Trinitarian understanding. So it's not really surprising that believers in that day understood in some form a Trinitarian concept of God. But the Trinitarian formulation was crystallized by Tertullian in the early third century common area. Now, like I said, the concept of Trinity already existed, but Tertullian is believed to be the one who came up with the term Trinity. And this is how he described it. He said, God the Father has a will encompassing all creation 
and redemption. The Son accomplished that will, and God the Holy Spirit applies the work of the Son according to the will of the Father to believers. Does that make sense to you? Is that a good, a good description? I think so. The problem, though, is that Tertullian's view of the Trinity was flawed. Because he and other theologians of his era thought there was some form of subordination in the Trinity. When you see some images of the Trinity, you see a triangle. The Father is on top, and the Holy Spirit make up the other two angles. Now, visually, that suggests subordination, to me at least. Um, the triquetra, I think, is a better uh, illustration of the Trinity because it's one image that has three distinct points. The problem, as I said, with Tertullian and some of the other theologians of his era was they thought God was the head, you know, and Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit were kind of like lesser lights. Thankfully, the Council of Nicaea in 325 settled that. And we come to understand from the council's decision that God is three persons, three equal persons, executing different aspects of our salvation. Now, when I grew up, like I said, I, 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 I thought of the Trinity as, well, like I said, God the Father. He's, he's, the, he's the head honcho, so to speak. And Jesus and the Holy Spirit, well, they, he directed what they did. And I think part of the problem with Tertullian's approach was there was this need to protect God the Father as being uniquely God. The Father is uniquely God, but so are the Son and the Holy Spirit. These ideas of God, who God is as Trinity, were kind of precariously expressed because there was polytheism in the world of that time. And how do you describe a God who is three persons but one to someone who's polytheistic? They'd be thinking, well, that's three gods. How can three be one? But that's the mystery, that God is three persons, in one, one in three. Part of the reason why the Trinity is hard to understand is because it's a mystery. And we sing God in three persons, blessed in Trinity, Trinity, or we speak of the three in one, the one in three, but those are statements of faith, but not real explanations as to what the, Holy, what the Trinity is and how we can understand it. But the fact of the matter is, we can't. We can't understand what the Trinity is because God is infinite and we are finite. We can wait for the day, hope for the day, when as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, we will know as fully as we are known. Thank you for that day. God's revelation as Trinity has always been about us. It's always been about us. God is for us. God loves us. God went through great extremes to reveal God's self to us. I'm gonna be really awkward <laughs> um, in talking about God because I'm trying to resist pronouns. He, singular, him, singular, his, singular. And the Trinity is 
singular only in the respect that this Trinity is God. God is Trinity. So bear with me as I kind of awkwardly work my way through this. God reveals God's self as Trinity because God loves us and wants us to know who God is. God loves and God wants to be loved. God so loved the world, but God wants the world to love him. There we go. When we love, we make ourselves vulnerable. There are things that we will let our loved one know that we won't tell anybody else. There are ways that we'll react to things with our loved one that we may not in the presence of other people. The idea of God being vulnerable, hmm, does that even sound right? But love by nature makes the lover vulnerable. God has made God's self vulnerable to us. And if you don't believe that, think of the fact that God has experienced grief. God has experienced anger. God has mourned. And God has been rejected and felt rejected. God is awesome. God is powerful. God is infinite. But God is vulnerable. Have you ever thought about that? That God has made God's self vulnerable. But the good news is that God's love never dies. And God does not change. God persists in loving because God can do nothing else but love. Because as John says in his first epistle, God is love. And if we look at the history of God's dealings with humanity, it's very clear that God persists in loving because as I said, God can do no other. One thing that is sort of interesting to me is the fact that human sin has in a way made God revealing God's love for us possible. We know that Jesus died for our sins. We quote John 3.16 so often that even unbelievers know God so loved the world. But it took human sin for us to see God as Trinity because God the Son became incarnate in Jesus Christ to carry out that redemptive act so that we could become his sons and daughters of God. When Jesus said to the disciples, no one has greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He was expressing that Trinitarian love. But the reality is that laying down one's life for one's friends certainly was the goal. But God's ultimate goal was not just for us to be God's friends, but for us to be children of God. Unfortunately, even though God wants our love, sin has made loving God impossible. You have the Apostle Paul who, you know, many of us laud him as a great apostle. And he was, and he's written most of the New Testament, by the way. 
But in Romans 7, Paul talks about being unable to do the good things he wants to do. And he recognizes that it's sin in me. Sin has mastery over me. But he goes on to say that that problem is solved when the Spirit sets us free. It is not that we consistently act out of love toward God, but the coming of the Spirit made it possible for us to do so. I don't have to tell you that we often make decisions that conflict with what our expression of love for God represents. We do it often, as a matter of fact. But we no longer have the can't help it. We can choose to act, even though we often choose not to act appropriately. We still can choose because God the Spirit dwells in us. And the good news is, God's mercies are new every morning. We always have a chance to change our minds, to change our behavior because of what God has done for us. Now, I want to ask you if you've ever considered that the Trinity is a model for how we should live as believers. There is no hierarchy in the Trinity. But we human beings like hierarchy, especially if we're at the top of the pyramid. We like being set as part as someone special because, well, we think we are special. And we are. We're special in God's eyes. But that being special should not come at the cost of our relationship with other people. Each of us plays a specific role in the family of God. But we're interconnected just like the three persons of the Trinity are interconnected. What should that interconnectedness look like? One of the ways I think it should look is that we prefer others more than ourselves, that we work together as a unit to accomplish the will of God. Because there is no competition in the Trinity. Competition began with Cain and Abel, and it persists even today. Again, that need to be special can sometimes cause us to compete rather than work together to fulfill God's goal for the world. The fact that God has poured out his love in us by the Holy Spirit means that we should be pouring out God's love to others. That can be hard to do. I'll be honest and tell you, there are some people I just don't like. And I think we can all say that there are people that we just don't like. But if we think of love in terms of just purely emotion, we'll never be able to get past that point of recognizing that love is about doing what is good for someone else, even at personal expense. I think of Matthew 28, and I think of the Friends of Grace. They're such a good example to us for how they work together and for how they pour out God's love on the food insecure people that live in our community. God bless you for that work. The Trinity is self-sacrificial. And that's a call for us to be self-sacrificial. Mm-mm. 
that's kind of tough because that means that maybe I don't get to do some of the things that I want to do. Maybe I can't go where I want to go. I might have to change my lifestyle. And I'm comfortable. I don't know if I want to do that. But Paul calls us to prefer others above ourselves. And that can be sacrificial. In fact, it is sacrificial. Now, a lot of times we think of sacrificial living in terms of giving financially. But sacrificial living requires that we give of ourselves sacrificially. It's more than money. Maybe for someone that means I don't go on vacation because there's going to be a ministry to the community and I want to slash need to be a part of that. It may mean that I have to simplify my lifestyle. It may mean that a job that I want, I don't take because of all the time and energy it's going to require of me until I have no more energy left to do. Sacrificial living for someone else. Now, I want to repeat Jesus' statement to the disciples that no one has greater love than this that a man lays down his life for his friends. If we love following the model of the Trinity, we will do likewise. We don't wanna do it, we don't wanna do it. I'll be honest with you, I get tired. <laughs> I get tired of living sacrificially. And sometimes I fold my arms and I say, I'm just not gonna. but that's what we're called to do. We often hear stories of parents giving their lives for their children to protect them, and children risking their lives for those they love. We're called to do likewise. The good news is we don't have to rely on ourselves to do that. We have power. Last week I avoided using Acts 1 and 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be witnesses to me. We receive power to become the children of God. I want to repeat what Tertullian said about the Trinity. God the Father has a will encompassing all of creation and redemption. God the Son accomplished that will. And God the Holy Spirit applies the work of the Son according to the will of God the Father to believers. Thank God we're not left to our own devices. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are with us and are in us. The three in one, the one in three. Amen.